I'm Elijah, and welcome to my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. Today, my guest is Scott Matthews. Scott is one of my favorite songwriters of all time. We sat down and spoke about his craft, his process, his influences, how he got into songwriting, the story behind his new album, his eighth studio album, Restless Lullabies, and he even treated us to the story behind his wonderful Ivan Novello award-winning song, Elusive. So please check out his website, scottmatthews.uk, get the new album and enjoy this podcast. Thank you for being here. Today on the Songwriting for Songwriters podcast, my special guest is the lovely and brilliant Scott Matthews. How are you, Scott? I'm very well, mate. How's it going? Yeah, I'm very good, thanks, mate. Thanks for being here. I can see that you're in your home studio there. Yeah, the shadio. So this is where this is a home studio, and this is where you record. Uh, this is where you record most of your work. Am I right? That's right. Yeah. Um, it's since 20, 2013, 2014. Uh, I started making the records exclusively in this in this shed, which is at the bottom of my garden, and uh, it serves a real purpose, you know, because you you know for years it was a, a great opportunity to to seize the moment. Yeah. Know, in that day and you know generally everything's set up yeah you know? and that was that was that was good for a work ethic and a and an immediacy yeah absolutely writing music and you know you can just yeah we can pick up phones and back in the day it was picking up a dictaphone tape machine for me and you know even micro i still got micro micro cassettes and things fantastic so uh yeah it's, this is a great space to to be creative but um yeah feeling like it's r- running the end of its course bizarrely okay so so why why is that what's making you think i mean i've got my own home recording studio and it's fantastic to have everything set up and it makes everything a lot easier um but i guess there are certain what am i looking for i'm looking for the word constraints there are certain types of constraints to a home uh, recording studio so what you know what's going on with you and why are you thinking that why are you thinking of coming out of the um, setup you've got into a different studio uh, not so much studios actually it's just um environments you know okay so i just the, the one thing i've always found difficult with a, a place which is very dead you know it's, there's a cleanness to the space as well and um the one thing i've struggled with more than anything is is that natural energy and atmosphere yeah. that you get from an adrenaline from a performance in front of yeah. people yeah yeah and when you try to mimic that and trying to generate that in a shed when you've just had your dinner you know <laughs> and the pudding is a disaster move as well, of course. We're trying to work that off, you know. That's that's challenging. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's more the the need to be inspired by a different space. I think. Yeah. And, and to capture something different, because as you know, you know, we all sing and perform totally differently depending on the acoustics of the room. Yeah. And uh, the way our voice projects in the space, and um, yeah, there's just a different energy level which I'm kind of keen to tap into more so. The more, make, really, the more I make records. I think that's really interesting, actually, that as writers and performers, we should be aware if something is pulling out our consciousness or there's a yearning there, that I think it's really important to, you know, remember that and to follow that instinct and find out where it goes. Do, do you know what I mean? Exactly, yeah, because I, I listen back to, you know, we t- most of the shows now, we, we take the stems from the from the gig and I listen back to them, you know, just, just as a bit of curiosity more than anything and just to see how things came across. But... Um, it's kind of revealing that I think I sing differently, totally differently to what I do on a record. Yeah. It's a different, different beast, you know, and that's, um, after, you know, 15, 16 years or so now, it's, uh, finally fathomed that this is the way to go. Okay. You know, everyone says, a lot of people do say that I sing kind of stronger, I think with, um, in a live performance. And I think I do that as well because there's just something that just stirs up from the the diaphragm energy as well because mm. you're pulling notes and you're singing, you're projecting to an audience. And there's that also just that a different dynamic. Yeah, I think so. There's always that type of. Uh, I guess there's a risk when you're singing live. There's a temptation to go beyond what you would do, and that's based upon the adrenaline feeling you have when you're performing live, and I, I suppose the audience being in the room. And I guess when 
you know, certainly what I feel when I'm recording a uh, vocal for a record, there's more concentration on the uh, technique and the and the breath, and also I guess wanting to focus upon the vocal being the thing which is going to live forever on a record, you know, and that's a slightly different thing to think about um, than when you're performing live. Yeah, because it's the danger of the comping features on yes. on yeah. on these recording platforms as well, but. Um, yeah, so there, there's, it's, it can be a dangerous game, you know. I think it becomes a bit formulaic, you know. There's just a bit too much precision, and I'm guilty of it still, you know, yeah. um, because it's a long time to live with it, you know. And <laughs> yes. I think yeah. you would just we get a bit, bit kind of precious. Yeah, that's and true. The, the, the process is there, you know, and I think that's it's just now about understanding, giving yourself some kind of boundaries and limitations. I think because for the the end result will will, will re really reflect that. You seem very aware. Um, you know, I've I've obviously um, met you briefly um, and supported you at a gig, and also I've listened to lots of interviews of, with you talking. But you seem very aware of your process, and also sort of like you study yourself as a songwriter, and you are very aware of the moves you've made in the past and where you're going, and you know what you need to um, or where you'd like to go with the next records. Is that is that important to you? I think so. Yeah, um, I, I didn't think for a second I'd get to, to eight records. Well, I kind of did, but then to, to yeah. suddenly be on, be on the verge of releasing an eighth studio album, you do become, and, and you get older as well, of course. So I think we, we get into a situation where it's like everything in our life, you know, we, we refine our tastes and we refine ourselves, and we still work on the bad bits, Yeah, you know, of yeah, ourselves yeah. as well. And um, it, it's all seriously all about discovery and, you know, um, I have kind of, yeah, I mean, there's an importance element, you know, this is my livelihood. Yeah, sure. But also as well, being a parent, um, you know, I don't worry so much anymore about the music side of things. Okay. You know, um, it's, there's an element of, uh, there's, there's a freedom in terms of, and a carefree nature it's in some respects to who I am now as well. Okay. Because, yeah, I've obviously got to worry about a little five-year-old boy. Sure. Finding his way into the world, as you know, it's, it's the parenthood is uh, brings on a whole new level of of worry. Yeah, it does change. It does change things. You know, I was twenty two. I have um, very lucky to have uh, an eighteen year old daughter, and you know, it does change things because you know I was in bands and trying to and had a record deal, and you know, obviously the aim was to make it and all the rest of it. But having a daughter at that age, it did sort of make there was something else, something much more big and beautiful to look after and care for and it was it was something which you know um i guess it makes you less self-centered even though as songwriters and artists we are you know naturally self-centered but it was a different um thing to care about you know and also time became much more precious uh you know how has how has being a parent changed the way that you work very much the same yeah it's um they're just limited you're just limited with time you know that's the thing it just brings a whole whole new world of, um, I think maybe touched on from the beginning there, just the, you know seizing the moment with you know, having the shed, yeah. And, and now it's about when you do have like say two or three hours to to make some noise, you know, you you have to grasp it, yeah. Because yeah. in the next breath you'll be picking up the little one, and uh, you'll be in a world of Thomas the Tank the next four or five tank. hours. Fantastic, you know. Yes. So it's um, yeah, it's ever evolving, you know, and and the writing process is. Has changed, you know. I'm a different guy to the to the passing stranger kid of 2005. You know, it's a totally different experience. Um, and I can see the evolution of, of who I am, and, and I can reflect on eight records and and really grasp everyone, every person I was at that point. That's nice. You know? That's um, nice. And I look back, you know, made a few mistakes here and there, I guess. But um, and I can see, I can I can hear the influences and where I was at. You know, like the third album is very wordy. You know, I was very much listening, reading a lot of Dylan Thomas at the time and just kind of obsessed with rhythm and syllables and mm. rhyme and all that. And I think in on reflection, some songs would have probably benefited from just holding back and saying, well, do I need to even sing on that chorus? Right, okay. The yeah, thing, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Like I did with Dream Song back in the, 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 the early day on the first album. You know, that was just, well, it sounded better by just singing, like humming a melody on the chorus rather than trying to find words for it. 
Yeah, there is something to that, actually, isn't there? There's uh, sometimes, you know, a melody, the the tune or the humming of a melody will just become, it just falls out of the sky and it's very effortless. And sometimes, I guess, you know, trying to fit words to that can be quite laborious, but there is something to just letting a melody or a tune just be itself without words, do you think? That's it, yeah, yeah. It's um, But I've, I've enjoyed every step, you know, and I think when you're, you know, it's important to move on like anything in our life, you know, but uh, when you've got the, the chance to kind of maybe evaluate where you are as well mm. from the next, from one record to the next, you, I, I do see the sense that I've kind of progressed in some way, you know, and people, a lot of people still love the very first album, you know, but I'm just as proud about the very new one that's coming out soon. Well, I think that's, I think that's exactly how it should be, isn't it really? That's, I mean, that's what you want to achieve as an artist, you know, I mean, I guess sometimes you hear, a big act or an artist say okay this new album is the best thing i've ever done and you listen to it and think okay maybe but it seems to me like in your work um there's a very i mean the, the new album's much more like the sorry the album before new skin is much more electronic isn't it it's more, it's like eno-esque and ambient um uh t- territories and soundscapes but it sounds and obviously i don't know where you're going with the next one but it, but all your work from your first album to uh this new album to me Anyway, it seems like it's a very natural progression, your your work. It's very authentic um, and all the songs sound very effortless and the progression between the albums sound very effortless. Like it's a very, um, very beautiful thing to listen to as a fan. You know, it's, it's, it's an effortless journey. Well, maybe that's, um, yeah, cheers, man. It's, uh, that's, I, th- I think that's maybe, the, maybe the, the, the goal, isn't it, to make it feel... Like it's already been, always been there, perhaps you know. And there's, um, yeah, I think maybe again circumstances with the last three years, you know, with the, the last record being certainly more me doffing my cap to the eighties. Yes. Yeah. You know? And so, oh shit, the drummer's been sacked. You know, yeah. there's a drum machine. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like okay, let's uh, let's just let's just try and do something different. And if it wasn't for COVID, I, these songs wouldn't have existed. And I'm so happy in a strange way. Yeah, but, um, that I got the opportunity to to seek this kind of pathway, you know. Is that um, is that is that being continued on the new album? The, the, no, that... well, it's again. There was always this pang of kind of intrigue, in you know, the, the last record, New Skin, was yeah, very much. There's a cocktail twins thing going on with yeah. the, kind of the, the angular drums, yeah, kind of dreamy guitars, big soundscape, kind of cinematic, cinematic and wide. Um, and I thought there was always the interest. In me to well, what what do they, what are these songs like completely stripped back sure you know, a rootsy yeah. record yeah. so uh, the new record is new skin part two but it's it's called restless lullabies nice. and it's it's a it's the lyric from the last song on the album of new skin and uh yeah it's me stripping the all the tracks back to nothing okay and Beautiful. uh it's big and bold and pretty empty oh and cool that's, uh, that's a great contrast because uh there was the challenge to think, well, have I just dressed these songs up on the electronic album, give it this kind of synth a- aesthetic, yeah. you know? Is it just basically masking that the songs aren't very good? Okay. You know? So, yeah, it was it was a project of intrigue, and it's proved to be such a great journey over the last 12 months. Um, and I'm super proud of it, you know, because in some respects now, I prefer these these new versions. Is it? The, have you done the same songs just stripped same. back or- Exactly okay. the same, same right, track cool. listing, everything. It's just, oh it's, wow, okay. It's a carbon copy of the last record, but um, yeah, for those that will you know see, see in front of the new skin, yeah. the electronic album, which was my friend Damien Hyde, uh, film photography, scanned all the images and very much grain, yeah, you know, yeah. And this new album is uh, my little boy's done the artwork for a start. And oh, he's only fantastic. four, fantastic. So he was getting into his kind of Franz Klein thing. Yeah. Getting, all, getting, getting all abstract on my ass, you know, with his little Japanese brush pen. Brilliant. And uh, he's created the cover, and um, that simplicity and freedom from a four-year-old, you know, yes. is a yes. natural expression, as, as yeah. maybe reflects in the music as well. That's nice. Uh, I was keen not to, I've always been so guilty of filling the spaces. Okay. You know? Oh, I could put another harmony there. Oh, that little textural spot there for like a group of something. Yeah. You know, I've tried to really make this record... Uh, reflective and just give you that real big windows to to think about it. 
It sounds like, uh, I mean, it sounds like a really big statement to have made, you know, to come out of new skin and to and to make such a big statement. And I, I really applaud the commitment to making a big artistic statement like that. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it, like, you, I don't think any more of a contrast from one song, you know, the song Wait in the Car off, mm. the, off the new skin album. It's very much, you know, it's quite a full on song, you know, baritone electric guitar and again, widescreen big noise you know real big cocteau twins snare drum type thing yeah, yeah and you know filling holes with big noises um but this one's got that it's so wooden and it's empty and i think that's i could probably gone the other i could have taken it back even more wow um, and gone quite stark with it but i think when people hear the contrast from the same song yeah it'd be really intriguing i think that's a really interesting thing to do you know it's um you know, like I said earlier, it's a big statement, but to to release new skin, which is beautifully produced, and then strip everything back, you know, I've often thought, I wonder what songs, you know, by what a song will sound like really stripped back, you know, those big productions that we all kind of go make and big artists make, but how wonderful to strip everything back and just have that song as a different version. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't anything like um, like some kind of vanity project, or you know, just me kind of. Uh, oh. I'm just twiddling my thumbs, you know. As I said, you know, I've got no time, so I have to be really. It's really it has to be real calculated. Everything mm -hmm. I do now has to be as clear yeah. as anything, as clear as daylight. So I'm just happy that I pursued it, you know, because um, again, if it wasn't for COVID, the, the synth album wouldn't have existed. But of course, this new record wouldn't have existed either. Well, that's yeah. I mean, two things there. That's the. I mean, lockdown obviously was, you know quite a strange time to live through wasn't it and also as an artist but obviously tragic for you know a very tragic time for everyone to live through but I think there was that thing as as an artist or songwriter like at school when you had the kind of wet play days and you just stayed inside and did art or you know made something there was that opportunity to you know you can often just wish like I wish I could have the time or the days to just sit around and and write songs and really lean into my songwriting rather than gigging, you know. So lockdown in many ways, I, I guess if you weren't ill, um, y it was a great time. So well done for using the time in such a kind of beautiful way. I think so, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, you know, you some, you, you, a little bit of these projects that kind of appear and you, you're just happy to get them over the line in some way. And yeah, sure. uh, it just feels completely justified, this record. Um, yeah. And the feedback already has has, has been wonderful, actually. Fantastic. Um, and I had the, the the opportunity to get it mastered at Abbey Road, great, which was a which was a big deal for me after sixteen years or so of releasing albums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we had some lovely feedback from Miles Miles Shoal as well, who's um, who, who's the half speed mastering guy at Abbey Road. Oh, uh, cool. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been really great to to get this one over the line. And again, it's it feels like a complete contrast in some respect to records I've done in the past. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm just happy that it, I've got the chance to do it. Um, as well as trying to, to juggle everything else, you know, running yes. my own record label and things. And, um, but again, it's, it's, the, it's the truth, you know, and that's, that's kind you, of when you, when you look back on all that, that's yeah, where you yeah. can kind of hope to, to, to feel that you've conquered the truth. Nicely said. So, so you, are you independent now then as an artist? Just always been yeah it's, it's since the, been. i mean island records was a was a deal back in the day for that lasted a couple of years you know yeah. we're going back 2006 um but we released the album initially on uh san remo records passing stranger and that was already you know doing the rounds for for a good few months april 2006 um but then you know the, all, the, all the big boys come calling, come calling my, my gig at the 12 bar denmark street years ago yeah, everybody, everybody was there. It felt, and uh, I was kind of, um, yeah, swayed by the the heritage of Island Records, yeah, as anybody course. would do, you know. Of course, yeah. So kind of got lost up in that in that whirlwind for two or three years, and then, uh, yeah, you know, obviously, from a financial perspective, it, it was it was great, you know. So this is coming from a kid who was on seventy five quid a week, yeah, you know, which I was yeah. at the time, yeah, from the label, paying me some kind of retainer, you know, just to okay keep things okay yeah you know which is measly i look back but it gave me some time you know um so i'm you know i'm grateful in that respect um but yeah the reality is ah oh, since 20 since 2010 um yeah completely independent brilliant 
No, and uh, my own record label, Shedio Records, was 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 born in 2016. Um, so that was uh, liberating, but very challenging as well. And you know, yeah, we, all know the, ch- we all know the struggles, don't we, of, of the industry? And mm. um, but we've learned to kind of operate in a very niche little boutique kind of way, which is very mm. limited, you know. But there's a lot of enjoyment from that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, be nice to flog a few more records, though. <laughs> That's always the case. But do you know, I met a um, a major, major star in a, in a huge band uh, a few years ago, and uh, who's a friend, of, um, friend of the family. Um, and we were backstage at this arena gig, and uh, he'd been very kind about um, our work, you know. But we're, we're like you, we're an independent act, and you know, we've got our own studio and pushing things. But one of the things he said, which kind of stuck with me was he came over and said uh, do you know I wish I had what you had and you know I'm sort of there thinking you're about to play an arena this is this is the dream right but he was saying you know it would just be great to be able to you know just record what you want to record and release what you want to release and do what you want to do and have that creative freedom and you know in in, in the position he was in he was just saying it was like the five of members of the band each member trying to get their own kind of um you know artistic expression across and then having to sort of make sure the record would meet the fans desires and then the label would come in and say what they wanted or what they didn't want you know and that's um I, I guess you forget sometimes because you, you're kind of recording in a home studio and there's a squirrel or running across the roof or crow sort of squawking you know the kind of little realities of it but you forget how lucky we are to have that in some ways exactly yeah you're right um I think when I, I, on reflection, you know, maybe that was probably why I got dropped so quickly from Island Records is because, uh, I mean, 2006, Passing Stranger was already recorded. You know, that was a record that existed without anyone's influence. Okay. Um, and Island Records, yeah, signed on the strength of that album. Right. So, and, I, and for the second album, I got to do exactly what I wanted to do. You know, I, I just said, well, that's the way it is. These are the songs, man. Deal with it, you know. And, uh, uh, but I can, I, yeah, I, I get it. You know, it's like, you know, there was a, a car crash kind of moments where, not literally, but, um, where they weren't going to release the second album, you know, okay, right. just because it didn't kind of conform to what they wanted. And, you know, okay. certainly never had a meeting where they sat me in the room and said, look, Scott, this is what we want you to do. You know, we need the hits. Right. You know, you know the first song was, uh, yeah. Depends how you want to read it, but yeah, the course wasn't very pleasant, you know. And uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it's it it was a uh, again the truth. That was what it was. Yes. The album. Yes. And yeah. you know, I got to meet Robert Plant at the time and tour with him, and uh, I just asked him if he wanted to sing on the album. Yeah. And he was very very much up for it, and uh, so I had that lovely moment and that kudos of. You know, just some bloke from Led Zeppelin singing on the album as well. Crazy stuff, crazy you stuff. You know, and it's, it was, I can look back on that record with a fondness, but also look back on that record and feel that maybe I should have given things a bit more thought, you know, that classic yeah. second album syndrome of just sure, sure. I the mean, window. Yeah, very, yeah. Very tiny window, it seemed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that brought along some different kind of pressures and uh, the, the writing pressure as well to, sure. to, you know, you, as you know, man, we just, we're just constantly finding notebooks and just old stuff. And then you, you're writing new stuff in cafes or wherever you are. Yeah. Yeah. Being inspired by a film or whatever it is, books. And then, you know, you commit that. You can only ever w- move forward with the songs that you have in that moment or they're, they're in your headspace. Um, but, you know, being running your own label, you know, you just get to, I've always felt like, you know, I'm not kind of boasting at all, but I've I've always been in a position where I can I can kind of call the shots. Yeah, you know. Well, that's the song. Those are the songs, man. It's like you yeah. know you have to accept it. You know. And well, that's the integrity that like people you know like for me like Neil Young's a big influence. It's like you always yeah. felt and the Beatles that they were doing what they were of Dylan. They were doing what they were doing, and that's it. And you know, in a way, that is quite rock in its own sense. It's just like this is who I am, and this is this is this is it. And and I think. It's so important having had, you know, I was signed to a label and when around the time that block party in Franz Ferdinand broke and I'm not influenced by their influences, but I remember at the time the management sort of saying, we need from you some kind of flock of seagulls inspired kind of block party thing. 
and I remember thinking like this is the wrong thing because by the time I've if I was to go that way and come up with it it would take me about a year to get it all done written and produced and by that time the, that moment's passed you know so yeah. if you're thinking like that I'm in the wrong position you know so the committing to your truth is probably one of the most important things as a songwriter I think so yeah I mean because you know the, obviously the will come a day when I'll stop well that's kind of weird to say us yeah who knows man but then it's only on the reflect in the reflective moments that you that you just really believe that was the right thing to do in that moment it's like anything music aside you know in that moment shit there's a moment happened and it could, it could be a yeah your child runs into the road and you just respond and you know and you're yeah, in yeah. immediacy you, you yeah. don't think you know you just have to kind of strike with what your you instinct got. you know let and, me ask um, you a question. You've got a sitar in the back of your yeah. shed there. And yeah. I've always felt listening to you, there's a um there's an Eastern influence. Um yeah. where does that come from? Because it's it's in your uh, I think it's in your melodies and it's in your guitar playing, but it's it's kind of a relaxed Eastern influence. It's not kind of yeah, shop, shop think, curry, but there's there's like yeah. where does that come from? Um well I think maybe as a as a kid, you know, listening to you know, kind of that kind of the string section on Kashmir, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, as a 13 year old going, Whoa, what, what's that, man? Yeah, da, yeah. Da, 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 da. yeah, 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 it's just all there, man. And uh, and then it evolved from there, from maybe in, in I was early 20s, um, getting into things like open tunings, and then you're hearing David Graham's Mor Moroccan influences, yeah, as a guitarist, and uh. And modal stuff, you know, and yeah, when you play like you, you're playing the guitar, like you're playing a sarod, you know, just something that's really open and just kind of almost right in itself, the repetition. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think things came from there, you know, I, I was obsessed with that kind of world. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of certainly hear it on my, my first album, with tracks like Dream Song and, um, and then, you know, things like Raikou, there's an album called The Meeting by the River. With That's Ra such Raikou. a great album. Such yes, a great album. with VM Bart on uh, kind of Indian lap steel. And mm. so all those colors and, 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 and noises were just intriguing. I've, I've, it's always been something that's just, just been there. Maybe the, um, yeah, the Eastern stuff is, and then some of the, yeah, of course, the Beatles. Yeah. You know, when they were kind of experiments within you, without you, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, for my, me personally, yeah, that that Raikou album was 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 quite an, uh, a big influence from in the early days, um, and yeah, then you then you move on to you know that record, and then you start to listen to Anushka Shankar as well. And my cellist Danny Danny plays with Anushka now these days as well. Fantastic. So I'm kind of tapping into that world and just you know glancing from a distance and trying to take a few little, you know, just grabbing little bits here and there. And, oh, that's a nice twist. I mean, that I was think from, yeah, it came from guitarist perspective mainly with open tunings. Yeah, it's definitely. I can. It's interesting that Zeppelin thing because it's. Uh, I was always a huge fan of um, Zeppelin. For me, it kind of like you know, like heavy rock. It's as soon as I heard Zeppelin, I was like, I kind of in a, in a sort of weird way. I was like, I don't need to hear any more heavy rock because Zeppelin have done it better than anyone else. But also on Zepp on Zepp three, yep. it's like. Wow, man! They're like in a complete... a summer's day. yeah. Love or friends, the song "Friends" and like they're completely Tangerine, different. Yep. Yeah, it's like those influences of um, those guys kind of quite early on from being so heavy and then kind of going into softness and sort of eastern areas. It's a huge influence on, my, on, on me as a writer as well. So it's yeah, interesting it's nice. you talk about the Zeppelin element. But I think that was my first introduction into that that kind of sound, you know, especially hearing hearing a sitar or a, mm. an eastern scale. You know, that was. Yeah yeah that was certainly a does does eastern philosophy come into this at all is it was it more musical element? i'd say it's more musical yeah i mean i dare say at some point um I, i'll find that side of things you know certainly an, another part of me which i haven't discovered yet sure okay uh so that was um again that's what life's about and i look forward to these these happenings you know where we do get to you know find something out about ourselves in the future yeah you know, and uh i'm not even aware what that is yet no you know, that's but, true um but you know it's yeah i've always been fascinated by i think open tunings ref give you that chance to really express the melody yeah. you know and uh yeah i love it but yeah so so i've got i've got two sitars here actually yeah. 
So where does songwriting come from for you then? You know, where where do they come from? Is there a, is there a sort of a uh, a process that you tend to lean into or, or a habitual way that you begin to write a song? What what's your uh, process in all of this? Um I think I'm always I, I think cuz I, I don't think a lot of people are aware of this, but I didn't start singing until I was about 26, 27. Okay. So I've always been a guitarist, you know, since I was you know, 10, 11. Right. That was, that's always been the starting point. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, I'm kind of fortunate that I have a few guitars, not many, but. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a good collection there. There's a few old, a few older ones in uh, on the wall, but um, yeah. So guitar parts, essentially, you know, like for instance, for me, if I go, if I pick up the 12 string, for instance, you know, I, this is set to a to a C sharp, so. So it's only already kind of lending itself to something. And then if you do things like this, you can kind of go to town on, I don't know, um, ambience, you know. So it's kind of 12 string, got a sitar thing going on. Just finding chords with the shapes. that's honestly that's absolutely beautiful really thank you for sharing your playing with us that's beautiful so i mean you just play you know you play with different chords and voicings until you find something which sings to you right is that how it works yeah i think so i mean i, I don't read music or my theory knowledge theory knowledge is pretty kind of absent so i think um i try to feel chords and you know, yeah. the guitar will often tell me what it needs to play as well yes yes, you know, yes. the guitar has a happy tension yeah. or a certain string gauge that really lets it open up you know and um so i, I that that informs yeah the way to approach it you know it's, it's, it's really good when you put the cap on the sixth fret whoa really okay yeah okay wicked man so i mean you just do you play, i mean do you play every day is that what you do you, you play every day pretty much yeah i yeah. think i play less than my parent yeah but, uh that's my own fault you know i should keep a guitar in every room really um yeah. but certainly that always dictates where to go because you know i think when i hear a piece of music i think when we all hear a piece of music we close our eyes and we we're thinking about something completely mm. unique and mm. exclusive to ourself um so yeah the, you know a, a line will come from somewhere you yeah. know i think i wrote the first line of that song that was a song uh, something real yeah and i started going there's always something in your head to tame those wild thoughts again The beast is on the prowl The demons to rouse Something to ease the weight To take away the strain a little something for your fire She is the flame to admire It's 
So I had those two verses. Useful. And just kind of, yeah. Those, mel like, those, those melodies are so, like, your melodies are so well connected to the to the music that you write. Um, it, it, I, I obviously understand as songwriters as well, the melody just comes out of nowhere, you know, and so it's not like you kind of are laboring for a melody. It falls out, up from my experience, it kind of falls out the sky and, you, you know, I suppose you play guitar enough, play a piece of music you're writing and it sort of falls into place. Is that is that how you experience melody? Do you sit down? I think to so, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. so. I mean, it, not everything to me comes naturally um, in, in life, you know, but um, I think the one thing maybe that I, I start to be in, you know, nitpick what I what I guess what I offer music, and I think melody is is the one thing I can seem to get some. I can get some kind of melody pretty quickly over most things when it comes to music. Yeah. So melody always dictates the form, I think. Yeah. Um, but I do struggle in other areas of, of music, especially when it's like you know communicating to a string quartet, for instance. Sure, sure. Um, but certainly, I was I always find a melody. Um, pretty, you know, I can come up with a few melodies based on a chord progression. Yeah, and if yeah. it's a good one, it will stick. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, again, you know, just brushing the riff of. Dun, 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 dun. I kind of suggest how I can kind of bounce over it. Yes. There's always something in your head, and of course, multitasking is a bloke as well you know yeah like okay what parts kind of sing yeah 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 in, the, in the gaps in the pocket especially with open tunings as well there's there's that you are kind of um there's that thing where you get the drone and you get the kind of harmonics of what you're playing so there is like quite often yeah. a melody in that piece of music which you just have to wait and sort of wait for it to come through but it's, it's there yeah. already sometimes like i often think in terms of rhythm or other parts actually in the melody that most of the time all the rhythm ideas and harmony ideas and other parts ideas are already there in the basic formulation of the guitar you know it's yeah. like you just have to kind of not get in the way too much and it will it will reveal itself that's it yeah absolutely that's the best way to put it mate i think um yeah the, these things you know seem to have a movement of their own and uh, yeah. you yeah. know the especially when it comes to a trial string you know that just has these all these subharmonics and extra overtones that that uh that, that reveal another part of the song or an, an, a new shape you know absolutely um, but um yeah you know but then it's not always uh, an, an easy process as well sometimes you have to you, know, you have a real interesting quirky melody or a chord pattern that's just like you don't understand it yourself mm. you know from my perspective it's like well, okay, i don't know the chords you know i've got a sense of what the roots are and you know major minor the suspense chord diminished you know just something that's just uh, suggests uh, the lyric as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's uh, yeah, they, but you, you know, you have to fight sometimes, you know, to you to do, really yeah, you do. things have to evolve in their own time. I wrote a song called "Up on the Hill" on yeah. my second album. Yeah, and um, I, I had the music for about two or three years. Yeah, and it was it was kind of crunch time. I just thought, well, this song really suits the the other kind of the synergy is good with the other songs. Mm. Let's try. And, I had one verse for like three years, and then. I wrote the rest in the studio, which was the first time and only time I've ever done that. Wow. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, you know, things take time. And then there's a new song called My Selfless Moon off the new album, which is also on New Skin. And that was a, song, a music I wrote straight after Passing Strangers. So I'd finished the album in 2005, I think. And then the Christmas of that year, I wrote the guitar part. And I've had it building for like fifteen years or more. Wow. Okay. You know? Yeah. 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 But then, but then the marriage it will be meant to. You know, it's meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's also sometimes. like not not giving. I spoke to uh, John Rob the other day about this, and he's saying sometimes just not giving up on an idea. You know, if it's got if it's got your interest for some reason, mm -hmm. it's you know I had a similar thing with one of my songs called Cherry Ripe, which is it took ten years to write. I had the, the, everything happened very quickly, but the chorus just wouldn't come for ten years, and then but I didn't give up on it. And yeah. it's that thing of just going back and revisiting things sometimes is part, yeah, part of the process. Because we, we get older, man, and we, we you know we, we we evolve in our own way. And, you know, sometimes you, you do have to just listen back to something, you know, especially when it comes to writing music, you know, because you know, you'll pick it up where you left off and think, man, 
I've got 10 years worth of uh, knowledge of, yeah, of another yeah. pathway. Yeah, yeah. Which will really inf infuse into that, 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 old, that old idea, which I've had lots of those instances. Yeah. And, um, and that's great, you know. It really is because, you know, sometimes there's an immediacy from, oh, the verse, the chorus, the, the bridge, mm -hmm. it's all there. I wrote the tra a track called Cinnamon. I love oh, that right. song. It's gorgeous. Oh, cheers, man. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was one of the quickest I've ever wrote just was because it? I, I just um, acquired a baritone electric guitar. And being me, me being me, I just I, was, I wasn't quite happy with the standard tuning, so I just dropped the, the, the keys a bit and uh, the root notes. And again, it's like it was like this energy was coming through, and the song yeah, pattern yeah. was just right in itself. I was just like yeah. this kind of this kind of pilot of the ship that was already kind of moving, you know. And it was just okay to take control and just steady the parts, you know, and just. Well, what do you think that is? Do you think that's, uh, I mean, I've spoke, your experience is quite similar to mine, I think, in the way that we write, but I've spoken to lots of different songwriters and they all, you know, explain some kind of communication or relationship with um, the muse, you know. Um, would you be as bold to kind of talk about that from your point of view? What What do you think the muse is for your, how does it, how does that work? Um, I don't know, man. I, I mean, it's, um, I look at it in terms of conversations, you know, I think, uh, I definitely struggle to, to be a kind of, I suppose, a somebody who can be comfortable talking in a group, with a group of people or, a, you know, just, um, I used to be a really noisy kid, you know, when I was like, when I was a teenager, I was, I was, I was, I was loud kid, you know, and just <laughs> a bit of a joker at school, Okay. you know, but, um, for whatever reason, man, I think just come, when I left school, went to art college and, and those intervening years as well, it, it's as if I just went into my shell big time. Right, okay. Massively, you know, and people were like, what, what happened to you? Where did you go after for, for all those years? You know, and um, I couldn't give anybody the answers, you know. I was like, well, I don't know. You know, I was just happy to be in my own space and, you know, constantly drawing, you know. I was an obsessive artist, kind of part-time guitar player. And, um, I think... It's this energy that's maybe always always been there. It's just been my need of, of like a release to communicate through the music. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's always been there since I was a kid, you know, on reflection. Yeah, yeah. That part of me is is, is deeply been there, you know. And um, yeah, so that's the, the, maybe this energy is just something that's naturally taken time to to come to the surface. Sure. Um, in through the form of song, you know, and that's. You know, you put me in a room, people, you know, right this second, and I'm quite happy to let everyone just keep going, keep talking. Sure. You know, um, I know I'm quite happy to just, you know, put the kettle on and just have a brew and just people watch. Well, know? that's part of it as well, isn't it? There's, there's, there's like a, if you're a performer, you can't help. And obviously on some level, because you, cause you're playing, there is an extrovert nature because otherwise you just would not be on stage. There's a, there's some kind of need yeah. to perform and release something, but yeah, yeah. also there's very much an introvert who wants to observe and wants to listen and is in your own head. And the yeah, balance of those two things, a, a kind of a heady mix, I think a strange mix of they need, are, yeah. need to be seen and heard whilst not wanting to be seen and heard at all. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, the head, the head space you get into. I mean, if I really thought about it too much, I'd, I'm not certainly got not got any kind of anxiety problems or anything, but you know, it's um, if I really thought about what I do sometimes, I'd have a big panic attack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think you know what? Again, coming back to being a parent, there's just that I don't care anymore. That yeah. I can go on stage yeah. now and just play. Yeah, you know, yeah. where I used to stress about the set list before and the okay, I'm taking five guitars on this tour. Okay, I'm I'm just tuning them on myself and I have all these kind of mini headaches. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Of yeah. what to do, but uh, now it's like, you know what, man, let's just get on with it. Yeah, just, yeah, absolutely. It takes me three or four minutes in between songs to tune the guitars, that's fine. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that was another Neil Young thing. I remember this, watching these BBC performances when just before he'd, well, he was writing the songs for Harvest. Yeah. And he's just tuning up and taking a while to tune up, but there's this confidence of like, well, he's got to get it right. And he's just, it really changed the way. Cause I used to have those mini panic attacks of like, Oh God, everyone's I'm tuning. This is a nightmare. I should be quicker. And yeah. watching Neil would just be like totally in the moment of like, I'm tuning this and I don't care. And, and, and I do care cause I'm tuning it to be right. So people hear a song, which is in tune, but there's a level of like, I don't know, like just experience. And also I guess being less kind of uh you know, taking things too seriously, like you say, yeah, like, I think it changes that, you know. 
That's it, man. And obviously, you you know, you, without you realizing it, but you know, you have resilience. Yeah. You know, and it's like you know, I read the the books and I've, I've, and the stories from Joe Boyd. You know, talking about Nick Drake and. You know, he just couldn't do it. You know, he had, took one guitar on the road. He, Joe Boyd sent him off on some kind of student union tour, yeah. you know, and yeah. you know, Nick being the kind of character that he was, yeah, he simply couldn't deal with it because, yeah. you know, there's, like you said, there's that, there's that clearly got undoubted ability and an amazing yeah. Yeah. performer in, in, you know, on his recorded form. But uh, as a person, perhaps he just struggled to find that resilience that he needed. You know, there's obviously reports of him having great gigs as well, but yeah, yeah. I think generally uh, we find this strength that we probably don't think we have. Yeah, yeah. and and it, it's um, it's just tapping into that once in a while, and yeah, and for me personally, it's just giving myself a little bit, of, a bit of belief, and just telling myself I can do this. You know, not being afraid to just go for it, man. What's there to lose? And also, I think probably coming from the Midlands, and because I'm from originally from the north, there's a bit of like having the kind of there's a humility to sort of uh, Midlands folk and Northern folk yeah. where it's not, not to take yourself too seriously. There's a bit of, they're, so, they're, yeah. they're going to be ready to tell you to sort of, you know, knock you down a peg or two if you need it, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's it, man. I mean, there's a, yeah, maybe being a, from the, the days of me being a bit of a joker at school, that sometimes comes through, comes through still. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, maybe this nervous energy. That's, uh, but you well, know, very, people have said it's, it's part of the show, man. It's, well, it is. To... I was just about to say that. Like when I saw, it, I'd had the, you know, the uh, uh, privilege of supporting you in Lime Regis at a gig, and and you're very funny on stage. It's just like a bit of in a relaxed way and confident, and you know, it's all, it's all there for you, mate. Like in in terms of, I've got to say something actually because it went. You know, you'll probably get bored of uh, uh, you know this this uh, talking about the track elusive, but when I was. Um, I'd, I'd been sort of I'd left the band and I was trying to figure out what my move was you know as a solo artist and I was working on this track and I remember being in this bedroom upstairs trying to come up with parts and listening to the radio and Joe Wiley played Elusive and I, I remember just thinking like fuck you know this is that is the most inc and still today it's in my top five favorite songs of all time you know it's oh, it was it just was like one of those songs of like almost I thought to myself what's the point this is like someone has just nailed it and then lyrically musically everything is perfect about that song and you know it's a song that i've loved for ages so i'm going to ask you to indulge me for a second Cheers, tell man. me about that song man and like and where, where it came from and you know and who it's about if it's about anyone or you know tell me just give me a minute or two on that on that on the track elusive uh yeah it's it's i've got a lot to be thankful for and grateful for for that track you know it's uh I was in a band in 2002. Uh, if you're in, if you're Dutch, it's a positive Verflieg, just okay. positive Firefly. Nice. And uh, that band was cool for me, and I, I enjoyed it. And I look back on those days, and uh, but we was very much writing songs, you know, a lot of energy of like, you know, the Chili Peppers or something like that, or the Strokes. Yeah. Um, so I was writing some, you know, and but also being into John Martin as well, and yeah. You know, some of my guitar parts were, were evolving quite fast, you know, in, yeah. in the space of 18 months. Yeah. And then again, that immediacy to picking up a guitar and playing. So I'm kind of doing, if I can get this guitar in tune, I'm going, it probably is in tune actually. So doing a lot of open D stuff at the time. So then the one day I'm just strumming away thinking okay i'll write something like this is you know is this it the strokes right you know that album yeah i love that just an Im immediate part so my fingers are just kind of finding shapes the version of elusive that, that wow was, that was born wow. and that was on the, that that version's on an album a, 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 a demo elusive Crikey. that fast and that tempo but what, is, what what was revealing was it it was so in terms of it being effortless chord wise you know it, it was kind of just written so fast 
that I didn't have time to think about where it was going. Sure. And then, then it, you know, we, we took that version into the studio, um, had a couple of lyrics at the time, you know, that I just kind of started going. You know, trying to get a bit of a rock song going. Right. right. And then uh, just it backfired, you know. The album version, everyone was putting all the pressure on to, oh, I can't wait for Scott's right to record Elusive. You know, everyone had earmarked the song as a, the one on the album, you know. Okay. First single. And I just got this sense of disappointment from everyone. On it. And I, even me recording it at the time was like, man, this doesn't work. You know, the intro was a harmonic for, you know. You know, and it was, and I did the same thing. So we re recorded that version. Um, the lyrics really, again, the lyrics were written pretty quickly. Um, I think because I got the chorus quite quickly as well. You know, she's elusive, I'm awake. Defiantly real, there's nothing fake. A mystery now to me and you. I open my eyes and I'm next to you. And and then I could work backwards then. And I don't know where it came from, but, you know. She's a gambler spinning wheels. The poison victim, a look of steel. Don't know what I was watching at the time. Coldest heart you've ever felt. The coldest hand you've ever held. So keep moving with the lyric and um, it was just suggesting to me that it, the whole thing needed a different approach. Okay. And, uh, I borrowed a friend's uh, Harmony Sovereign. It was a 60s Harmony Sovereign, the 1260, the, the big aeroplane bridge mm. uh, acoustic. I think Jimmy Page had one. Everyone had one at the time, John Sebastian. And uh, I wanted one. So uh, I, I put an advert in the paper, the local paper to us called the Bargain Pages. And um, somebody found me up said, you know, I've got, he's like, I, I can do, do the guy's impression. He's like, all right, mate, Joe, I've got, uh, I got one of these uh, Harmony Sovereigns if you want it. Yeah, about, about 50 quid, all right. I was like, <laughs> lied, lied on my feet, I was there, you know. Yeah, yeah. My, my old man took me to the guy's house and picked up this Harmony. And it was a different version. It was a 1961 Harmony Sovereign, but it was um, the H55, I think, with the, with the neck in the, in the, pick up in the, in the base of the neck instant love for this guitar right took it back home didn't clean it or anything and just because uh, the strings were really dead and so dirty but i started going on this guitar she's a gambler spinning wheels the poison victim like a steel and there's only four strings on it as well so i was right. playing just with my thumb on the wow. top wow the coldest heart you've ever felt, the coldest hand you've ever held. Taking down on a way, a million miles, still no headway. Has her love truly blown in the mind I'm proud to roam? And the chorus. As we all kind of know. Fantastic. And man. it was just, it was, it was just as if, as if the, that, that lyric that had been written and always there um it was as if that the way i was delivering musically gave the, it just mm. set the bed for mm. for, the, for the words and um we that, what i forgot to add was we, we got a break in recording so yeah. in this in this kind of summer period i got the, i acquired the harmony sovereign and on the phone to the producer john Cotton saying john i think uh we might have a different take on this song mm. uh, so we we kind of rescheduled the, the recording process and went back in and recorded that version in one day and uh it, again it quickly evolved you know john was all over it because that was john's thing the ambience the yeah. mic john's technique for uh, engineering mixing right down john street that was the first moment where me and uh john cotton actually kind of gelled in terms sure. of our vision sure, sure. Uh, because i wouldn't have dreamt to come up with anything like that and the way john treated the backing vocals right um mm. And we we took we took the backing vocals from. I recorded an an, an alternate version of Elusive, yeah, uh, on a Strat with the tablas and a sitar, right. You now and and me thinking I'm doing like my kind of machine gun Hendrix thing, you know, right, 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 right. okay. Something like that. 
Nice, nice. Groove was nice. quite cool, man. Yeah, yeah. But um, fortunately, the, the the tempo is the same as the new version I was working on. So we took all the backing vocals from that, and we we dropped them in on okay. the chorus for the first time. Yeah. And John and I just looked at each other as if to say, "Shit, that's the one, man." They oh, did the way man. that everything was overlapping with each other it was kind of spooky. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd taken the vocals, I didn't sing to this particular version. Right. You know, I'd, I'd taken the vocals from another another version of the song. It's as if like just like a copy and paste thing. I'm just dropping the vo- voices and it's what happens. Wow. And uh, I got lucky there. Um, Was, is, is it a song about, and uh, I mean, that is the most, one of the most incredible, I mean, because I've thought about that. So I've obsessed about that song for, t- for, t- for bloody years. And hearing that is, is like a real treat as a fan to, to, to hear that. And it's, it's, it brings up a lot of interesting uh, elements of songwriting really, which is like the idea that you're writing you know in the first instance for like inspired by like the strokes or something and just like sometimes it's good as a writer to put yourself in i've done that so many times where you right i'm going to write something in the style of of that you know something comes quickly and easily but also you know talking through the process of just like really realizing that's not quite it and having to look at something else then the accidental thing of the harmony guitar and playing something differently because there's four strings on it happy accidents you know, dropping in an, a different kind of vocal part. It's really, really interesting that because it's 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 a really creative journey from something which obviously was born quite quickly. You know, and the melody is quite. It, yeah. yeah. But is it about is it about someone in particular? I mean, I don't want to put you, you know, don't answer if you don't want to. But is 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 it based on someone, or is it did the lyrics just fall out of the sky and become a kind of uh, thing? I itself? think yeah. I mean, it's uh, the, the, all 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 songs that kind of mean something. Yeah. have a mystery yeah yeah let's leave it there yes yeah it reveals so, you know, why do, yeah. so here's the thing i always said about on my songs it's like when fans come up to me after a show and that people ask that question as well about lucy mm. and mm. i know my response has always been like why don't do you want to kind of spoil the magic it has, it has yeah, for you it's, it's true because that you're right about that because actually it's, it's, i'd rather not know actually the truth of it it's like it's elusive that's not a cop um, answer by the way that's just um but a lot, I think a lot of my songs actually uh, stem from, you know, I've all, back in the earlier days, I had a lot of notebooks, so I'd, I'd write stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, I don't do that as much as I should these days, but um, uh, I can probably even at some point, if I had a bit more time, I could probably dig out the notebook with the opening verse to Elusive, mm. you know? I just start going. She's a gambler spinning wheels, the poison victim, look of steel. You know, I was just right. It was stream of consciousness thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Coldest heart you've ever felt, the coldest hands you've ever held. A lot of people get it wrong, actually, on the lyrics. I mean, I've had um, people singing it differently, and I've seen stuff on YouTube, you know, and it's like, I didn't say that. You know? <laughs> and it's like, it's just wrong. So it's nice to kind of get some clarity. Maybe we can add the lyrics to this podcast or something. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, yeah. if you want the definitive answer, there it is, my friend. There it is, yeah. You know, and, you know, I say, yeah. Ticket, I'll go. Uh, Taking down on a way, a million miles, still no headway. Has her love truly blown? Is what I sing. Right. People say, as I learn to live long. It's like that's right. not in the lyrics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the not... context, man. You got to, it, it relates then. See, when I say, as her love truly blown, you yeah. know, mine, I'm, I'm proud to roam. It's time well, explosion. That, there's something really great about misheard lyrics. I had a friend of mine who, who for years thought, the, what song is it by the verb? He, he was saying he thought the lyric was the cause of the thorns you wore, dear Lord. And uh, it wasn't. It's, I think it's just because I walked here alone or something. But it was that misheard lyric was like gave more yeah. meaning in this. So it was like, wow, what do you mean? The cause of the thorns you wore, dear Lord. I was like, wow, what's that? You know? <laughs> so there's something great about mishearing things as well. There is, yeah. There, there is de- definitely that. And, um, and also, as a little, I'm sure we all do this, but as a as a writing trick as well, um, I definitely kind of most of the time step out of character. Like I had, I had a real phase of pretending that I was Paul Simon, right? You know, and yeah. Tom Waits, just yeah. because well, why not? Yeah, you know, yeah because absolutely. I was I was too busy thinking about what Scott Matthews would think about. You know, right, okay. well, just yeah. get rid of that. Just get rid of that guy. You know, bin him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. And, uh, and 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 truly, it actually worked. Well, you to can hear the point that was, where, uh, yeah, it's crazy. 
you can hear that in like your writing there's like there's like you know i remember what a manager at the time because i at one time i thought you know he was kind of going into with the band thinking i was jim morrison or something and he was saying you like you've got to be careful of how you wear your influences in, in your songwriting and he was made a very good point but when i listen to your stuff um you can hear elements of influence but it's it's done so respectfully and beautifully that you don't think oh that's you know that's that's so and so it's just like the as we all do we soak up influences and and you kind of you can hear moments of like paul simon there but it's never like oh that's paul simon you can just hear elements of the way he writes not a copycat the same with yeah. nick drake there's like elements of the way nick would write but it doesn't ever feel like you've copied anybody and i think that's one of the things is in songwriting where you know when when you get a new songwriter to come on the scene or whatever that there's recently for example there's been a lot of people doing the ed sheeran thing hitting the guitar and doing the kind of you know white guy raps thing and it's like you can know where it comes from and it's like fair enough the kids having a go but there's a point where your influences have to be more careful you know and yeah i just say you, you know you've got that you can hear all that stuff in your in your songwriting but it's always just balanced beautifully yeah i try to try to just um yeah if i'm writing something like i had a spell where on, on the, the album the great and told where i was uh yeah again maybe thinking of uh of, of of kind of an approval side of things you know from someone and i've poor someone being one of my heroes yeah just kind of getting his approval and just just imagined him on my shoulder for a second just mm. sitting there you know mm. yeah. oh, what do you think of this one yeah you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, so like for instance when i'm going off the album, the grand told. So if I, you know, if I'm doing shapes, things will just evolve, you know. So I'm writing this. I'm writing the chorus to a song that the Grant told. The, the verse part's going. I'll tell you what. Let's do some reverb, shall we? Get on there. Cool. So I had the opening verse of. Um, Turn the leaves as seasons old Still a season to unfold And to see the reason starting life anew Many changes I have known Through the stages I have grown Trying the blues and the spotlight Putting my world on the line Turning only for the time Never know what I'll find Stunning, The point man. is Stunning Thanks, dude. It's, it's, um, I was just getting Paul Simon's approval on the chorus all the well, time. Well, you, you can sort of, you know, there's like, I can, I know what you mean. There's like, it's not at all Paul Simon, but there's, you can kind of. If I did a very awful impression, I'd go, you know. Putting my world on the line. Yeah. You know, yeah, turning yeah. only for the time. You know, suddenly that's how it's like, that's how it came to be. Never knowing what I find. I think I was thinking of like old friends at the time. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, that yeah, spirit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good thing actually to, to like you say, just to put ourselves aside and just like imagine you're writing a All song time. for, you know, it's just very, very good. I had this, I was once writing, trying to write a kind of song for, um, which hopefully be on the new album, uh, like a P Lennon y piano thing. And, uh, Obviously, I was thinking about that and had a dream where I was at a party and met John and Yoko and a few hangers on. And in this dream, John John's like, so you think you can write a song, do you? 
quite cruel and quite kind of like this sort of John sometimes you hear like oh shit he's really intimidating and he sort of chucked me a guitar in this dream and went go on then in front of like <laughs> his cronies so I played this song and in, in, in the dream he goes like yeah you're all right kid and then I woke up and just like it's that thing of like oh thanks John I'll carry on with this song you know so it's <laughs> like it's funny how that stuff hits your subconscious it's right man it's, that's it it's um yeah I think uh I have to do that quite a lot just to yeah, just to just to think differently. I mean, the, the whole left and right brain thing. Yeah, you know, I can I can come come back and look at some old drafts and notes and, and one line liners of lyrics. You know, but um, yeah, I just I I think having wrote the records that I have as well after you know this will be my eighth studio album. Uh, I've got I think I've got a better grasp of myself when it comes mm -hmm. to maybe editing as well. My mm -hmm. wife used to be a, um, a sub editor for. A, okay a magazine and okay. uh so she, she she really influenced me in so many ways she sure. wife sally and uh but she um started getting me to i start to understand uh the draft of my words and the structure of yeah. forms of poetry yeah. yeah and you know just kind of almost like decluttering the yeah. process yeah yeah you know yeah. and um being a bit more succinct with things and just a bit more kind of some, some clarity there's a the clever wordplay which was the headspace i was in with my third album, What Night Delivers. Sure. You know, that, that repetition, that kind of clever turn of phrase and syllable yeah. marriages um, and the sentiments. But then you um, you start to uh, grasp yourself and you, you edit yourself better. You know, that, that comes with sure. arrangements of songs as well. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I try to trim the fat of these yeah. pieces of music, you know, yeah. and I think, well, that, that's, I've already said it there, you know, yeah, sure. move on. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, but just try to make the arrangements very interesting. Yeah. So, like, you know, the bridge of that song then would, after the chorus, there's a, it, and it's that resolution of that, that question, you know. So after the second chorus, we'll be going like, um, so second chorus, um, putting my word on the line, turning a leaf at a time. world will find how am I to know the pages yet to show Chapters unknown. And how am I to grow until a new seed is sown? Until the harvest to glow. Only that. Beautiful man, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, did such a joy to hear you sing and play, and thank you for doing that. Let me just take you a couple more questions because I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've been very gracious with your time, and that's okay, man. And playing. Um, what's coming up then? So the albums, the albums coming out. Uh, you've got a single coming out and an album coming out soon. Yeah, so right? the 20, 28th of April is the fantastic. release of uh, Restless Lullabies, which is fantastic. the the new record, which is like the sister album of New Skin, brilliant the previous record. Very stripped back, you know. Um, as you kind of heard me playing there, it's, it's got that got that feel, but with less reverb on it. <laughs> Very yeah, empty. Yeah, yeah. I didn't love, reverb on it. Of, love a bit of reverb. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's uh, then. There's a full UK tour uh, commencing oh, cool. April as well. So April, Fantastic. May, June, and then yeah. off to Portugal for some shows. Holland, uh, trying to get some Italy shows as well. Fantastic. And then uh, heading for another uh, the second phase of touring from like September onwards. September, October, November. Uh, 
We're trying to do, I can't do the whole two week block thing anymore. You know, so I'm trying to stagger the shows. Okay. One show yeah. here, one show there. And, um, so that's the, yeah, it's the exciting, it's like exciting time, you know, new record. And, um, again, just putting fuel in the tank, these yeah, records yeah. and just seeing yeah, if I can go yeah. with them. Uh, see, see where they take you. That's it, man. That's it. So I feel very lucky that, you know, I'm getting to do that again. And, um, and yeah, we, we started the pre-orders, uh, for the album, the uh, Friday just gone. So, uh, yeah. So people but, can actually start to pre-order the album. Where can they get the album from? Uh, from my exclusively from my website, which is scottmatthews.uk. Yeah. Nice and clean. Yeah, nice and um, clean. So yeah, that's uh, and that's going to be on uh, on oh, yeah, of course, half speed mastered Abbey Road as well, which is a big one. Yeah. So I pushed the boat out this year and uh, sold a kidney, and uh, and yeah, Abbey Road half was speed that, half was, mastered. Yeah. Was that a kind of? Uh, I imagine it would be a, quite a dream. experience to be in Abbey Road. Did you feel the vibes? Mate, I felt them big style, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pulled up on the car. I mean, for a start, just opened the gate myself, you know, parking <laughs> in, a, in a bay. Yeah, that's you know? enough. That's already a good, already a win, yeah. three win, isn't it? That's it, man. So we've got Miles Shaw involved. Who's, uh, he's the half-speed mastering uh, guru. You know, he's been responsible for all the Beatles remasters. And okay. Bob Marley, John Martin, Solid Air. Wow. Um, he's got an, an original Neumann lathe which was found wow. in an old factory, which he has refurbished um, right. to the tune of to the tune of probably twenty thousand pound or more. Um, all brand new tubes as well. So, so Miles uh, and my record was the first one he he, he, he uh, mastered with all the new, all the new tubes. Amazing. Amazing. So um, that's a, I was I'm absolutely you know a kid from the black country as well. I was absolutely bowled over by that experience. Yeah, of course. Um, and it was it's a dream, you know. I wanted to do that from the very beginning. Yeah, Passing Strange was never on the bottom vinyl. Um, so that was a real fitting kind of icing on the cake moment because yeah. Miles has actually made the record sound even that bit more transparent and, you know, you can feel your way through it. Yeah. You know, it sounds yeah. so clear. And um, and because of the, the nature of the album, which is very stripped back, I think it's that's maybe its strength. It's really brought out the, the purity of the album. It's amazing how much mastering can, you can really change the, 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 and deepen the feel of an album, isn't it? really amazing yeah 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 well we um as you'd imagine with abbey road i mean they've got six six fairchilds original fairchild compressors Jesus. so miles uh has, has got this basically a brand new clone of one uh that cost him a lot of money and yeah. this was like the, the juice extractor man the the, the but this, these two magic buttons honestly we heard the the ab of the of the two masters and the it was kind of it was a very very subtle thing but suddenly you, you notice when this Fairchild wasn't reacting yeah. when you bypassed it. And um, it, it's really brought the album to life. And um, so I can't wait for people to have it. You know, it'll be on uh, limited edition, transparent vinyl as well. Beautiful. Man. Um, still sticking with good old CDs. And also for the first time ever, we're doing cassettes as well. Oh, cool. Um, so we're going old school, man. You know, we're yeah. going to get those mothers chewed up, you know, and uh, dig out the old Sony Walkman from back in the Sturbridge Art College days. Yeah. The bus. When I was a 16 yeah. year old listening to the police. <laughs> You know? how, do, how do you think uh art college guy went to art college too <clears throat> as as a uh songwriter or what how do you think art college impacted you as a as an artist as a as a songwriter as it, i'm going to use the word artist which encapsulates songwriting and, and art being a you know painter or whatever as well how do you think that experience impacted you as an artist um i think initially i can i can i couldn't see the relationship from especially because of what, of what i was into which was very much a wanted to be a comic book artist okay that was the dream you know um painted art you know like when i think about the frank frosette of the uh, frosettes of this world you know very much fantasy art and uh and all the greats you know think about the classic black and whites of you know jack kirby and people like that of marvel mm. Mm. i wanted to be an artist you know um so but i i you know that was th those two things were running parallel being a guitar player that was into rock as a teenager yeah. in Soundgarden and um, Bell Jam and people like that. So uh, I struggled to maybe find the, the marriage because the processes are, for me have, have been quite drastically different. I mean, I couldn't mm -hmm. find the, the relationship between comic book art and, and music. Um, probably more so my, uh, as, as I've got older, you know, you know, like with my little boy creating the artwork for the new record. Yeah. I can yeah. totally see the relationship between what he's created and my music. Sure. 
Sure. Um, yeah. And I have got a massive appreciation for for art in general, you know, and and how that can influence pieces. You know, I can I can see something from Kate Colvitz, you know, the German expressionist uh, uh, printer, you know, and an artist, and she. I can some of her work speaks to me as well. I can see stuff all over the place, you know, and and um, and yeah, and really channel that that one that one has suddenly influenced a, a song more right. so. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd say that's been the case for the last ten or fifteen years. Yeah, okay. Uh, art has been quite a big player, I'd say. Yeah, still conti and continues so, to be. Yeah. And Sally, obviously, as a sub editor of a magazine, as you said, has kind of had an influence on you, like editing or perhaps you know influencing your way of thinking about editing. Do yeah. you have a, is she, is she your go to, do you, do you like run songs past her? Have you got like anyone that you run songs past or is it, yes. you, you know? Sally's the key one. She's, she's the, uh, yeah, she's like the, uh, she's got like two, she's two, got two lights, you know? Yeah. One, the ones like there, you know, the magic bulb that you want to, to kind of yeah. give the on switch to, you know? Yeah. Then the other one is just like this dead bulb, man. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, you can do better than that. <laughs> um, but um, there's certainly, yeah, I mean, it was Sally's title and poem, New Skin, right. on the last album. Um, I asked if she, you know, if I could use it, uh, oh, the cool. title. And um, and we we write together, you know. Um, oh, cool, cool. I'd imagine, like, uh, uh, we do it, we've we wrote together quite a lot over the last few years. And Great. We, we, we both feel it's really cathartic and it's really good for us to yeah, write together. Yeah. And yeah. Um, who's, the, who's Tom Waits' partner? Is it Catherine? Oh, I forget her name. I, I can't remember. remember, but I know Tom writes with his wife as well, and um, it's it's great, you know, because we we live our life together. We have done for twenty years. Yeah, and sure. it's like we, um, you know, we we find something in it together, and you know, I can look back through our notebooks, and Sally can see a couple of lines from there, and she'll give me a different spin on it, you know, and really? um, and, and another track called "The Tide" off the, the new album as well, and that was Sally's title. Um, but I, I know the. There's a, there's a, she understands that she gets a real connection as well from from where we've we've gone together yeah you know and um but it's, it's, it's been great you know we we enjoy the process and um you know and feel that like there's a there's a there's something to be said then there's a message that in that in, essentially that a listener can hear and and feel the importance of it and get a connection to it um, yeah man Beautiful. that is the ultimate goal isn't it yeah man definitely it is you know it's it's a privilege isn't it to sort of you know, from my own experience, and I'm sure with you as well, the the feeling of having the privilege of soundtracking someone's day, you know, whether they're listening to you in your car or in their car, sorry, or, you know, whatever, however your music is soundtracked, someone's life is, uh, is a beautiful thing. And also, you know, f from my own point of view, like how I found myself in your song Elusive or in the songs of the Beatles. And, you know, that's finding yourself in someone's music or songs is, you know, I mean, that's just, it's a great thing, isn't it? And to, to, to have happen as a fan and if that happens to your music if someone finds that connection that's amazing isn't it exciting. exactly yeah it's as that it. mate it's um yeah we feel fortunate you know that you know i can i can i can watch a couple singing a song of mine in japan singing yeah. it in a bathtub yeah yeah well, not, not with any clothes on they just <laughs> fully, fully clothed you know yeah. singing elusive yeah and that, that, this was years ago and i'm like man the fact that songs can travel today, you know, it's it's obviously it's always been the case, but so instantly immediate yeah. for a fan in New Zealand yeah. just to tap into the song and yeah, you know, we constantly get messages of um, you know uh, of of hope and uh, and how a piece that I've written or we've written together, you know, has has, has had an impact on somebody that's that's been you know, literally their savior. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. really extreme levels yeah. of of connection that have kind of bowled us over quite yeah. a lot you know and and we kind of it, it's you know, it can be very overwhelming to read it because you think, okay mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just there writing a song you know, a piece of music yeah. Yeah. pressures of trying to put words and music together and going through the whole pr process of trying to make it yeah. heard yeah but then the, the key thing is there's somebody there that you don't know yeah that has really taken every word yeah and uh, and kind of put it somewhere safe in a little box yeah and, and really treasured it and uh and until that's you know that seizes you know i think i'll always be doing that you I, know? it's a bit, you're right i've had a similar experience of a couple of songs where you, you it's such a strange thing because you're like well man i just picked up the guitar that day i have a vague memory of like 
feeling something and it sort of happens and then you get the sort of report back from a fan or someone who's heard your music and it's impacted them in a certain way or time in their life yeah. and and it's sort of changed stopped them from doing something or they it stopped them from whatever or given them some something they needed and um without sounding too worthy about it you were just there with the guitar weren't you just like muck it just playing and so this energy is yeah. is beyond you know just being a songwriter it's something else you know and that's again it's important not to get too over analytical about it because it just is life you know it's just it is art and art travels and it does what it does but it's yeah yeah it's a very beautiful thing it really is yeah i do feel blessed and um you know i think after you know post covid and i was still going on but you know when people can come back to shows again um i really i didn't think i'd kind of get emotional but the, those first handful of shows were, were astonishing and uh mm. You know, from doing nothing, you know, for a long time, I got a call from Plenty asking if I wanted to, to open for those guys, uh, Saving Grace, his, his band, you know. Fantastic. And this was a sold out tour. So from going from absolutely nothing to writing in my shed and, you know, living such an isolated life that uh, suddenly in front of like 1,500 people all wearing yeah. masks, you know, it was quite, quite an overwhelming yeah. uh, feeling to kind of be surrounded by. It was, it was strange. Yeah, but also um, just made me totally realise why we do music and yeah. uh, just that simple power of connection. And we're all in the same room, feeling that moment where you just stop, you just drop the guitar part, and you hang on a vocal part, and the space yeah. just carries. Yeah, and everyone's hanging on the word, and it just becomes this spiritual thing. And I think since you know post COVID, the, the the gigs have all been pretty spiritual, and that's where I'm getting that kind of side of me, which is really kicking in now i think yeah 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 um you know because um we're kind of making it for last time and um recognizing the importance of having somebody with you in that room listening yeah yeah and understanding the words it's uh man, it's a massive deal it is a massive deal yeah it absolutely is it sort of verges in to slightly into quantum mechanics there my brain just went into this that idea of like you talking earlier about the records the record but when you take it live something else happens and it's almost like the song when you're performing it's being observed by other people so this it's become a collaboration like in when, and when you have when you decide to pause and let the voice hang there's a collaborative element because it's being witnessed so it has a different power doesn't it it's a yeah so i'm tripping off a mere head there but it's um keep going man it's all good yeah. <laughs> i think yeah, it. but it's great man it really, really is uh it's, it's it's been it's proved to be pretty special i've i've definitely i, I think what's interesting now as well maybe with being a parent with the shows i don't know if you find this as well but it's as if going back to the kind of carefree nature of, of it now I don't, I don't care anymore it's just like i'm so more present yeah in, in the room with everyone not just kind of disconnected from my own head and just kind of letting something else take over yeah i am tuned into the to the to the gig yeah you know and i would never have dreamed of doing this before i had my little boy elliot but now i'll unplug the guitar now and i'm going in the audience for one song nice. and just being with everyone yeah you know i'm sniffing everyone's hair you know <laughs> and just like just being close man yeah you know and it's like i would never have done that years ago mm. i think it just mm. it shows that i'm now I'm, I'm i'm 47 now so i'm just like just do it you know because yeah, I love you're, that. the regrets will be huge and that thought will always linger so i'm just like let's just play and just get to and everyone every gig since i've been doing that you know for a couple of years now as as being on a different level to anything I've ever created in the past. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, this it sounds like there's a, you know, by, forced by lockdown or whatever, or just being back, there's a renewed sense of, and uh, being older parent, there's a sense of freedom. And that, that is, uh, that's a beautiful thing. I should hear about the, your new album and what you've done there and to talk about and hear you, your gigging process and going into the audience and what you're saying is there's a sounds like there's a very healthy sense of freedom and authenticity that, that yeah. a space you're in you know i think so yeah and uh, yeah long, long may it continue yeah good for you listen let me ask you one last question and thank you so oh, much for being cool. here mate um i have i've asked everyone who's been on the podcast so far to answer this question which is a hard question and it will change from day to day but if you could have written any song that isn't yours. Any song by another artist here today, what song would you uh, have liked to have written or lived inside or made? Oh, man. I should have been prepared for that one. Um, and I've definitely given an answer for this one years ago. Uh, and I can't remember what it is. Um, it's got to be some someone 
um, it's got to be some like maybe Paul Simon, I'd say. Yeah. And you know what? You could pick a whole host of Paul Simon written songs. Yeah. And yeah, Kathy's song, great song. Um, yeah, going back to old friends as well. Old friends sit on the park bench like bookends. Yeah. Paul Simon's way with words. I think he would have to be, I'd have to come back to this. Maybe we can add it some way on, yeah, you know, sure. on the blurb for the podcast, but um, it's probably going to be a Paul Simon song. I'd yeah, say well, those two, Kathy's song on bookends. I mean, old friends are kind of, uh, yeah, definitely two that I've imagined living inside too. So that's a great answer. Oh yeah. It's, it's going to be either from, it's going to be either be Johnny Mitchell, Paul yes. Simon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of those two, I'd say. I mean, it's precious music, but for me, it's. Um, but you know, there's a lot of great contemporary stuff out there as well. Um, but certainly, one of those tracks. Uh, yeah, it's a shame we can't do some magical editing, isn't it? <laughs> I think. Well, if you if people have are listening haven't heard those tracks, you you need to go and listen to them because. Uh, Kathy's song for me is. I mean, that's like. So. Uh, <laughs> To England where my heart lies. That's the just, one. Yeah, that's it. Just there before the grace of you go, I. I mean, I've, it's those that line, you know, just like yeah. spend about a lifetime thinking about the balance of those words and how that kind of what well, that <sighs> conjures up. It really could. And the, the freaky thing was, man, this kid, you know, was a kid. Paul Simon's like twenty-one. Mm. My twenty-one years when I wrote the song. Twenty-two now. Crazy just levels. Like, it, it really is, man. I mean, I mean, I wasn't writing songs until I was like 20, 27, 28. I started singing. And it's, um, yeah, different times, man. Totally different times, you know. It's like you think of uh, Nick Drake as well. I mean, he was, he was gone by 20, 26. Crazy. Hendrix was gone by 27. And that, the, the wealth of material that, that yeah. the Hendrix estate is still putting out is astounding. Yes. Yeah. Four years, man. It was pretty much doing his thing. You know, '66 he came to England, and then he was gone by 1970. It's crazy, but isn't it? You talk about what he compacted into those yeah. four years. It's yeah. pretty astounding. Well, it's and the same as the like, Beatles legacy. Like, you know, oh. seven seven years. You're just thinking, Jesus Christ. I mean, that uh, seeing seeing in the kind of uh, you know get back documentary and just you know, it's just the. I think what was it like uh, white albums at like number one in November and then they're back in the studio in kind of in January the second knocking out another album I mean they're all a bit miserable and cold but they're still up for it and it's just the work rate is like I mean again it's like in your albums that you're so prolific it's like I think that's a really powerful thing just keep working you know keep doing the work and yeah it's, just, it's crazy what they did those the, the artists of the 60s 70s and the time frame and it is man it really is you know. we've got a set of mechanics that we kind of utilize and you know uh have kind of formulas that of of the process but but yeah there was a there, i think didn't george harrison say the one year they like they fulfilled like a world tour and create two albums in the in, in a 12 month calendar you know, and we th- maybe we overthink these days, but there, I think there's such, such a heavy pressure from from those times as well to deliver and you know, the singles and the yeah. albums. But yeah. again, walking going back to the Abbey Road thing, you know, as soon as I walked into the into the reception there, and you could see all the photos of everyone that's 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 lived there and recorded special music in those in those in those walls. Mm. Um, so to kind of get that connection, as I sit here today, you know. Yeah. With, you know eight records under my belt I, I do feel very lucky that it kind of feels like the beginning of a brand new cycle love that you know of experiences you know and and i can look back with fondness and regret but um you know essentially moving forward now believing that in terms of me getting older and refining myself yeah I understand myself a lot clearer and um and i'll still continue to make mistakes you know but but um i'll be able to look back on records and and get that real sense of, of who I was. And, and, and this record is definitely no different, you know? And there's the, I think, you know, there's, there isn't really ever a mistake, you know, there's just a kind of intent and expression. And, yeah. you know, it's like, you have to be cool with those as well, don't you, sometimes? And just, uh, it's like that thing of like, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you might change what you've done to a record or you might have left a song off an album, but that song had to go on for the next song to come into existence. You know, it's yeah. just part of <clears throat> part of that. So um, Exactly, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Listen, Scott, thank you so much, mate, for your time and, and these Pleasure. those insights. And um, you know, this will be uh, going out soon. And uh keep on keeping on, mate. And I'm a huge fan of your of, of your music. So uh thanks, and your songs. So thank you, buddy. Cheers, Lina, and thanks for your time as well, mate. Thank you. Thanks, mate.